Okay, uh, this is a video uh, in defense of intellectual property uh, inspired by what I see as a uh, uh, precipitous development of criticisms of intellectual property uh, on, uh, on YouTube and uh, I guess uh, I guess everywhere uh, libertarians uh, wander and I haven't really heard any uh, any sat satisfiable defenses of intellectual property so I I'm going to offer my two cents and uh, I'm sorry for the poor uh, microphone quality I, I definitely need to invest in a uh, in a good microphone, or I need to speak louder. Uh, one of the one of the two. Um, so, without further ado, just get good posture here. It's going to be a while, and I want to make sure I look good. I'm in a new, new location, by the way, because it's night and. Uh, I'm in the same room. I'm just uh, I just shifted my uh, my headquarters, reoriented it, uh, so I'll, the camera's not lagging. Maybe I need to get a new camera too. I don't know. Anyway, enough with the uh, procrastinating. Here we go. Opponents of IP have two major points which their criticisms reside, both in the realm of morality. IP violates freedom, and IP is not utilitarian. For the former, strongly advocated by Stephen Kinsella, or Stephen Kinsella, however it's pronounced, uh, no offense intended, IP both limits what you can do with your property, which is a violation of the philosophy, philosophy of liberty, and IP is not actually property to begin with. That is, ideas are not scarce and do not fulfill the sufficient conditions of what constitutes property. First, the fact IP limits what one can do with your property i.e., if I own a printing press, I cannot use it to print Harry Potter and sell it, does not diverge from the principles of property rights. If it is illegal to take a baseball bat to your windshield, is my usage of the baseball bat violated? What about using my spray paint to vandalize your house? Property rights, by definition, limit what one can do with their property to ensure its protection from destruction. This is why opponents of IP do not consider IP to be property to begin with. According to their argument, property is for scarce resources, and since ideas are not scarce, one cannot, quote, own an idea. Yet through their own logic, human life is scarce, as this is the basis for all property rights. Furthermore, products of human life are property, transformed through human labor. Yet why does this discount arts and inventions? How are these not products of human labor? Even if we take the implicated presumption of a platonic realm of ideas, after all, if ideas are not products of labor and are merely discoverable non-scarcities, this is the inevitable conclusion, a merely discovered resource by humans, how is the act of discovering not considered a form of human labor, i.e. homesteading? Resources, by definition, have value. Using this logic, Harry Potter has no value. That is, people buy the book Harry Potter not because of the patterns of symbols printed on pieces of paper, specific pieces of paper, were implemented uniquely by the labor of J.K. Rowling, but because it is paper and ink. Likewise, according to this logic, people do not buy a CD because of the unique transcriptions etched onto polycarbonate, polycarbonate, excuse me, representing a, a unique song, but because the CD is polycarbonate. Hopefully the reductio ad absurdum is clear. For the second criticism that IP hinders innovation, this is a straw man. Let us assume, of course, the innovation being referred to is in the context of the marketplace. Here the objective, recall this is a utilitarian argument, of IP is not to promote innovation. As per the U.S. Constitution, quote, to promote the progress of science and useful arts, end quote, does not necessarily refer to marketplace innovation. 
In fact, IP is not necessary for an inventor to sell a good. However, IP provides him greater incentive to disclose his invention in detail than through the alternative, disclosing it through the marketplace, through sales. There is minimal risk to filing a patent, as opposed to the capital needed to sell a product, and hence the uh, risk of that capital. Thus, patents offer a virtually risk-free method of disclosing an invention. The fact that this hinders innovation, i.e. limits consumer choice, is besides the point. Certainly, property rights hinder the population from voting themselves the right to sleep in any house they choose. Intellectual property rights are an indicator of a mature and diverse economy where such rights are necessary to the society's complex production. Contrast this with poor economies, and it is simple to see why IP is a sign of a society's wealth. The reason it is castigated is because IP is evidence of the necessity of the state, making it a primary target for anarcho-capitalists. Yet criticism of IP only highlights the fallacy of resting an entire political philosophy on a simple axiom. In the case of anarcho-capitalists, the non-aggression principle. Reality becomes absurd.